and here we go. So, hi everyone, my name is Francesco, director of Silicon Roundabout and general partner at Silicon Roundabout Ventures, and thank you very much for, for coming today. And today we are going to talk about fundraising from US investors, which uh, is something that all of you, probably most of you from Europe and the UK, where community is based, uh, might be interested in, especially in times of COVID when we're all going virtual and the horizons are expanding, especially for tech startups. And so we decided to bring this piece of content to you. And before I get started into introducing these speakers, I just wanted to give uh, an initial special thank you to Live You and Tmart. Um, and in fact, it's thanks to them that today we're having this event. So Tmart uh, and Live You are really helping startups these days by helping them connect to great engineers and developers and teams uh, across Europe. And that's particularly particularly helpful for startups, say, in, in the UK or even in the, uh, in the States, where uh, the cost of hiring local engineers might be quite high, and therefore having a decentralized team might help bring down costs, but also efficiency. In fact, uh, the quality of talent that we see across Europe, and not just in the London HubSpot, uh, is something that uh, has greatly helped companies in our community, uh, and therefore uh, we're very, very happy and pleased to, to support Tmart. This is not just the only event that uh, they're supporting. This is only the beginning of a series to help you founders uh, take your startup to the next level and we're bringing great content for you to learn, especially on the strategy side. And today we're starting with fundraising and we're focusing on US investors. So I'm gonna bring down the introductory panel for today and uh, I'm going to start uh, the actual webinar. So today I'm joined by Ariel Kramer, the Global Marketing and Communication Specialist uh, for today's webinar that will be leading uh, the webinar and the panel discussion. Uh, I'll let uh, Ariel introduce herself in a second and then Ariel will be joined by Kerry Ranson, President and Founder at OC4 Ventures, uh, Technology Entrepreneurs and Executive, as well as investors, uh, as well as Greg, uh, who is a partner at XPTO Group. Uh, and again, Greg, an experienced venture capitalist and entrepreneurs. Uh, and they, the three of them together, will be bringing knowledge to you as to how to best market yourself and present yourself at US Investor. So, Ariel, do you want to take the lead uh, and get started with today's presentation? Yes, thank you so much, Francesco, for introducing all of us, and major thank you to Team Art and Silicon Roundabout for hosting us. We're really excited to be here today. So I'd first like to introduce uh, Carrie and Greg. So Carrie, uh, I'd like you to start off first with what OC4 does and your experience in the venture and startup world so far. Sure. Thanks, Ariel. Uh, hi, I'm Carrie Ransom, and uh, as uh, Francesco said, I'm the uh, founder and president of uh, a new venture studio that we launched last year uh, covering and really focused primarily on Southern California startups. Um, we um, have experience uh, starting and building software companies all over the world, but primarily are, are focused on what we think is this next generation of uh, entrepreneurs that are taking advantage of, of the diverse capabilities that exist throughout Southern California. And so, um, as we get into this discussion, we can talk about how we even plan to work with international entrepreneurs, and, and we're seeing many move to this area to expand or launch their ventures. My background is really, as I would call, an operating investor. I've been in the software industry for about 25 years, principally as an operator, have had virtually every role that you could possibly have in a company, from uh, chief cook and bottle washer to CEO and uh, just have, have learned a lot of lessons about what to do and probably equally, if not more, of what not to do. And um, in launching a venture studio, really feel like where we can help a lot of founders shortcut or short circuit time and wasted effort and things that they think they need to learn that they don't by bringing a very experienced, capable team around them to focus them in their area of genius and support them in the early stages of getting uh, a business off the ground. And so we will invest capital into the companies. We will also invest what we call sweat equity 
or our team into the companies to get additional ownership and choose the right kinds of founders that we feel like we can help make uh, even better than they're likely to be on their own. And so that's, that's what we do within our venture studio. Thank you, Carrie. Greg, please share with us your experience, what you've been working on lately. Uh, okay, hello. Uh, thanks a lot, Ariel, and everyone for having me. I'm really um, grateful for the opportunity. Um, so yeah, m my name is Greg Carson. I am a, a partner at XPDO Humla Ventures. Um, I'm the head of venture capital and corporate dev at uh, the XPDO group as a whole. Um, um, basically, we are an uh, early stage fintech and AI investor, um, global focus. So we have investments in Silicon Valley, New York City, um, all over Europe. Um, we're making investments in, in Asia at the moment. Um, we have a, um, a team um, in both our headquarters, both New York City and Paris. Um, my background is uh, coming from maybe 20, 25 years. It's, it, the background keeps growing <laughs> as I get older, but um, starting out uh, growing up near Silicon Valley in the Bay Area, um, going to school in Southern California, starting my first company there and then doing again in New York City. Um, but then shifting gears, um, getting my MBA and going back to, um, I did investment banking on Wall Street and in, uh, in London at UBS Investment Bank um, and was a, a early, uh, like a venture partner in a venture fund in, in, um, in New York for a while. Um, then I reset and recently went back about 10 years ago into early stage uh, venture capital in Europe. So I did very European focused investment, specifically Nordics. Um, for a number of years. That's where um, I was fortunate enough to meet um, Ariel and uh, um, see her um, um, have her amazing career in the nor North Europe. Um, so right now what we're doing at XPTO is um, we are focused on, um, we're working with um, um, LPs um, and taking in LP money from various sources, um, family offices, uh, sovereign um, pension funds. And we're investing that capital very strategically in um, uh, fintech payment systems, um, digital asset um, uh, ecosystem related things, um, everything from, uh, from just core AI accounting to Bitcoin system to um, AI um, analysis tools, that type of stuff. Um, we're really focused on the emerging digital asset and digital a transformation of banking and, and payments as they occur now. Um, we look for early stage invest, investments with, um, you know, great entrepreneurs that are really um, passionate, but also have some um, ability to get early and aggressive traction. Okay. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, so I'm Ariel Kramer, and I have been working with startups for about 10 years now. And I've had my hand in PR marketing and also working just with the uh, a freelance journalist for Business Insider and the Wall Street Journal and Huffington Post. So I've gotten to interview a lot of startups. And the problem that I face is that you can have a really great product, but you don't know how to market yourself and you don't know how to properly communicate. So I found that it was best to bring in uh, Carrie and Greg talking with both sides of the table and learn that there is more than Silicon Valley. Uh, where you should be seeking investment. I know that a lot of startups think that this is the uh, best place they could ever go to get money, but that's actually not true. But in order to get that funding, you have to obviously present yourself in a certain way. You shouldn't undersell yourself. A lot of European companies I've seen don't know how to properly market themselves. They don't know how to communicate. And if you do, that's fantastic, but you need to know the right way to do it. So I'm fortunate enough to have Carrie and Greg join me. So the first thing I want to ask both of them, Carrie, we're going to start with you, is what is the first thing that you look for when investing in a company? Sure. Yeah. So not surprising. I'm sure Ariel, um, it, to us, it all starts with the founder. And at the end of the day, this is a people business. Uh, people, you know, people tend to buy from other people. People tend to uh, want to or not want to do business with other people. And so for us, it starts with uh, the founder. And so, you know, the, the typical characteristics I look for, number one is commitment. Are they really committed? Is this something that they literally feel called they have to go do? and that they can really demonstrate you know, how they got to this place where they, they need to go do this. And this is, is critical because, as I mentioned earlier, we really want to hone in on what their area of genius is and, and try and keep them as focused on that as possible, particularly in the, the early stages. Um, second would be how coachable they are. Um, this is a, 
human development process. Building a company has a lot of things that are even counterintuitive to it. And uh, you know, how coachable someone is um, is pretty critical, particularly in the way that we like to work, which is about really embedding ourselves in this company as almost co-pilots, co-founders with a, a really committed founder. And then the third uh, is collaboration, right? Which is how open are they to really understanding that to build a great company is going to require a great team and that they're going to, while in the early stages, they feel like they have to control everything. That often is the worst characteristic as they get some early traction and get farther along in being able to really see a great team and great culture emerge. And so uh, we love to start with the founder and, you know, more than anything else, uh, we, we want to find that person that we think we can just make that much better as a entrepreneur, as a human, as a leader, as they go about this journey. Absolutely. Thank you, Carrie. And I think one thing that's important that uh, we've seen through Stubbs Think, all three of us is, knowing when it's the right time, like who's the right person for the right positions. Uh, and I think that's really important. And for all of these European startups that are attending today, I think it's really important to be self-aware. And that's really something that American investors look for. So you may start off as a CEO, and even though you're the founder, maybe you're not going to be the right fit for the CEO in the long term. And there's obviously there's movers or shakers or builders. So it really depends what stage. And that's something that's really important for an American perspective is that you are self-aware and you know when it's time to toss a baton or you know when who should be involved in what role. So Greg, that leads me to your experience uh, with working with startups and uh, what you've seen and what would you look for when you guys invest? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Um, I could agree with it. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, hopefully I'll find something I disagree with, carry on, but there won't be much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll try, a, a we'll try to make point. it more interesting. I'll, yeah. I'll try and make it more conflict, more conflict here. But um, I think what he says is quite good. Um, I think um, if we're talking about European investments in the U.S., there's a very, um, you know, American investors. I'm American originally, but I've been in Europe now 13 years and worked with venture firms all over Europe. Um, um, the generalist firms in the U.S. are very are are quite focused on proximity. You know, if you're not in their region, it's going to be really hard to convince them to make a you know France-based or Sweden-based investment. It's, you know, I mean, it's it's possible, and you know, we have good examples of Klarna in, in Sweden, and we have um, you know Spotify and number of these other ones. But then the um, you know after we go through the checklist that Carrie did, you know, people focus, the coachability is really um, important especially if you're going to have an over-the-border investment, uh, investor, and you want to go into their region because they're going to know their region better than you do as your entrepreneur. Um, I think that the key thing that, that, that I would add is um, traction-oriented. You know, um, I think that a, a, an entrepreneur that does not have real traction, um, like customers, transaction, um, really strong evidence that their business model is on the right track, um, are going to have a hard time getting an investor and especially an overseas investor. Um, the other side of that same coin is that you have, if, if you have the traction, um, you need to play that up and, and really focus on bringing that to the table when you meet an investor. For us, traction is, um, you know, we, we have, you know, dozens and dozens of potential opportunities all the time. And if you have traction in the market, that's one of our key themes. Um, you're at the top of the, you know, you're at the top of that, that stack. Um, um, even if your management team is missing a couple key component, components like what Ariel and, and Carrie said, um, we can help, uh, you know, that's where the, you know, like if you're open to taking on onboarding new people, um, it could be quite useful. I really look for a, an entrepreneur that is traction focused, really, you know, like um, it has an open personality, has a mindset that doesn't have any limitations. You know, they really can see themselves getting to the next level. Um, and then I really like it if an entrepreneur can show that they are, have the ability to attract and maintain um, their own talent. You know, other executives, uh, if they've attracted the top CTO, or if it's a CTO that attracted the top CEO, um, you know, if you have that ability to bring great people next to you, that's really the, in my, in my experience, that's been like a big, key success factor with our with our best investments or a big team accounting team three, three people oh 
Oh, absolutely. So what should foreign startups and entrepreneurs keep in mind when pitching to U.S. investors, Greg? Um, first of all, it's, it is a little bit of a numbers game. You know, you have to, you have to get in, in front of the right um, uh, investors. Two, not to put a lot of energy or um, disappointment into no's. No's have a lot of, re- like a no from an investor. Um, there's 10 reasons that you could get a no. And only maybe two of them have to do with you and your team. You know, it could be their fund uh, position. It could be the geography. It could be um, your sector focus. It could be they're in, they're already in an interesting, you know, a similar company. So when you're pitching, you really have to go in with a very, um, I think if you're pitching a U.S. firm from Europe, you have to go in with a very collaborative mindset, like Harry mentioned, you know, like, hey, we're coming into, we're coming into the Silicon Valley. We're going to open up until, you know, we're open to having a, a business development or even moving headquarters there. We're open to you suggesting, and you know, a head of marketing or head of operations or someone that's going to be the U.S. side. Um, that kind of openness, it doesn't mean that you have to commit to anything. If you don't have that open mindset and combined with um, a real clear description of your traction or your potential traction, you won't, um, you will have a lot of trouble, I think. Thank you, Greg. So, Carrie, let's say we have one of these companies come and pitch to OC4 at uh-huh. some point. What uh-huh. would you go ahead and look for if I'm making an overseas investment? It would be the first of your kind from OC4. What would you particularly sure. look for in the team? So, I think Greg Greg hit on uh, a couple of the key ones, which you know, from my perspective, I I really want to, would want to understand if they have not yet entered the U.S. Uh, they don't have a U.S. customer base. Why? And why is that actually a strategic advantage at this stage of the business and, and market's evolution? Because I think most, most people here feel like the U.S. is one of, if not the most attractive market for many, many types of business. Not all, but, but for many. And so if you don't yet have a, a strategy for here or for some other key markets and you've, you've incubated it in... Uh, the place where you are, why is that? And and I think having a good, really good explanation, a good story, which could be fantastic, it could be you found something out, or um, in this case, the market where you are developed earlier, and, and the better you can help connect those dots, which may be difficult to do if you're you're really in that environment where you are, but finding ways to really help connect those dots. And then to Greg's point, really starting to understand how are we going to enter this market? Because in many cases, it could be 10 to 100 times bigger than the market that you're coming from. And are you prepared for that and what that will cause? So I think there's, those are the kinds of things that I would really want to understand as we've started to explore some of those opportunities where maybe somebody has a really interesting technology uh, and product that they are getting some early traction with in their market and, and is novel and unique even to the U.S. market, what we typically talk about is, okay, what would it look like for, uh, like, are we even setting up a completely different legal entity here? Um, do we need to, to almost fund this a little bit differently, depending on the type of business? So I think there's a lot of considerations. And so back to what Greg said, how open is the entrepreneur to those kinds of discussions, um, which could even mean moving the whole thing to the U.S. if that's really what, you you know, and so we don't have a necessarily a a playbook that says this is how it has to be, but I think we have to find that open-minded discussion that says what's most important. Is it, um, you know, you running this company or is it making this company as great as it could possibly be? And so really, you know, starting to determine those kinds of, of things. Greg, did you want to add something? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good, uh, he kind of sparked a, a thought to me. I think um, it seems to me, it seems that there could be um, two ways to look at the U.S. market. There's investors that are going to invest in your firm as your strategy is in place. Mm-hmm. And then there's going to be investors that will invest in your firm because you have a U.S. strategy. Um, what Kerry mentioned is quite important. Um, many U.S. investors, and it sounds like, uh, you know, like him in, in, in L.A. will be very focused on He's an expert in the U.S. market, so he's your tool for entering the U.S. So that's a really good opportunity. Some investors will say, "Hey, we, you know, we're not in like, for instance, us. Um, 
we don't really care if you're going into the US market or a global market or Europe or Asia. We want you to know your market. And if we want it to be a market that we're interested in, um, or you're going to the US market. So I think doing some homework to know who you're pitching to is going to be important. And, you know, has that firm even invested in any other European firms before? If they have, then it might not even be a US play. You're just talking to US investors that want it, especially fintech. You know, fintech in Europe is just taking off right now. Um, you can attract a US investor for a fintech play on European soil. Uh-huh. Um, and then the US is upside. The other side, the other one is exactly as he said, which is, you know, what's your play? What city you're going to be in? Are you open to having an office, uh, you know, in the VCs, you know, incubation lab or um, around the corner from them? You know, I know one of my firms is considering an office in Silicon Valley right now. It's a, it's a Nordic firm. Um, and they're going to, they're looking at putting their business development office next to the two or three biggest partners in, so, you know, uh, in East Bay. So it's the same thing. It's a good point. So would you both say that you would look for market validation across the, like globally or looking for market validation specifically in the regions they want to target? So I, I would start with the latter, which is, do you have traction validation period? And what I really look for is that reflective entrepreneur that is saying, this is why we have market traction, market validation, where we do with this customer segment, because we know them, because this market is uh, an early adopter in this particular realm. So, you know, I, I tend to be the type of person that just asks why many, many times to peel it back to really understand. And so I think to Greg's point, um, the more you can do that as the entrepreneur and understand, hey, there's an opportunity in this market right now let's go there and then we think because of that we can understand where to go next and it could be because of competitive advantage it could be because of how the market is uh, changing it could be regulatory it totally to, to me depends on the actual business and the actual market that you're you're in the customer all those are are key dynamics but it's really spending the time to to dig into that to try to to understand, I mean, because that, that's often how I look at, at opportunities as to what is the real actual size, right? The, the hand wavy, this is a huge global market is usually not sufficient to get me uh, attracted because, you know, a TAM of a trillion dollars isn't usually the actual addressable market or the you know, serviceable market. You have to, you have to go a few whys deeper or layers deeper to really understand what it is. Absolutely. Greg, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think I agree with most of his points. I think uh, the, um, if we go back to kind of what your, what we mean by traction and what we mean by um, um, ways that you can show that you're going in the right direction, it can be very much, um, you know, it could be um, uh, exam. The best is to, is to go this kind of a tried and true MVP route where you're going, you know, you actually have a, small, reliable product that has some transactions and you can build upon that. Um, When we say traction, some people mistake the word traction to mean, you know, activity, you know, and when we say traction, we're kind of financially focused. We're like, you know, show that there's a business model, show that there's a revenue model, show that when you spend X, you get X customers or that X customers are asking for X product or, um, you know, we've made some, some, some money, of course. Um, it takes money to make money in some cases. I see, I see the two biggest limiting factors for any company are going to be the mindset of the management team and the capital available. These are the two limiting factors. Um, if you have either one of those is too low, you won't, you know, you won't make it into the big leagues. We actually, I'm, I'm going to start asking some of the questions that we're getting some questions here. Suggest. Um, well, you, if you need the capital, then you need the, I mean, not all, not all projects can be done on bootstrap for free, of course. Um, so if you need capital, you need capital. So that means that either you, um, have a strong enough, um, track record as an entrepreneur that you can attract a strong seed, um, seed investor. Um, 
Option two is to apply to and get into any one of the amazing um, startup boot camps. You know, you have Y Combinator, you have Techstars. I'm not sure about Kerry's program if he has something like that. In Europe, you have a few really good ones um, um, in London and in Norway and France, everywhere. Um, and then the third way is to get friends and family money to get to your first step. Um, you know, um, there's many different ways that you can, you can get there. Of course, if you need money, you need to raise money, which means that that's a project, you know. You need to treat your financing and your capital raise like your product launch, it's a project. You know, you have to meet X number of people, you have to pitch them, you have to learn from your mistakes, you have to, you know, keep, keep pushing through the process, I think. I yeah, I, mean, I, I call this like the great entrepreneurial challenge um, as well is, uh, you know, if, if you are developing a true valuable solution to a problem, then often there is even opportunities to finance some of your early product by getting customers, uh, getting them to pay, getting them to prepay, um, you know, maybe to pay for a pilot. Uh, th th these are places where it, it often requires some real creativity on the part of the, the founder and the founding team. And, and to Greg's point, uh, you know, the, the market, you know, as much as it can feel really inefficient when you're in the early days, capital to build a business. And often, uh, if you have too much, you're only going to uh, slosh it away. And sometimes those constraints can be the things that really help focus you as an entrepreneur on the things that really matter. And so capital has a way of, of being relatively good at finding its way to where it should go. And <laughs> it's not perfect by any stretch. But um, I think, you know, often, as, as Ariel said earlier, that Self-awareness is so critical um, to really uh, to really help hone you as to you know what do I need to do to make myself more investable, backable, uh, credible. Um, that those are often the more critical things than just uh, being able to talk somebody into writing me a check. Absolutely. So one thing I want to get into is the marketing communication standpoint when companies pitch to both of you. So I know from my experience, um, I often get hired to help companies reshape their communication and their marketing strategy to fit the US market or vice versa from US to European. So I often find that everyone thinks they're the best company, everybody thinks that everybody should care about them, invest in them. So the differentiating point for me is actually like data backed evidence that they have a product that works. And I know that's something that's really important to investors and that they're able to articulate their product within just a few minutes in the beginning of the presentation, you should know exactly why you maybe want to invest in this company. So uh, Carrie, I know before the pandemic, I'm not sure how the situation is now, but you're uh, on average talking to, I guess, at least 50 companies a week or more, um, people that were interested in pitching to OC4, if I'm correct. Uh, and Greg, I'm sure you've had your share of companies as well. So Carrie, what were some common mistakes that you saw? I know that you weren't speaking specifically to European startups, but just in general with uh, the communication and marketing style, how they tried to articulate their product and why you should invest in them. Sure, I, I think there are probably a few common uh, mistakes that I see. I mean, number one is not doing homework. Uh, I, you know, I, I get a lot of really generic uh, pitches just like desperately seeking a, uh, you know, can, can I throw a bunch of things at the wall and see if something sticks and you know, it could be wildly inappropriate to what we tend to focus on. And so those, just by the fact that they have reached out, they haven't done much homework. And then there are other cases where they could be really, really relevant to what we're doing, but they don't understand the kind of background from an operating standpoint, from a market standpoint that, um, that I have in, in a realm. And they start to educate me about something that I probably know more than they do about. And that's really difficult to, to see them as, as credible because they just didn't do some of the, the basic blocking and tackling. So I think that 
um, that lack of homework is probably the most common one that I feel like, you know, taking a little bit of time to, to understand why am I reaching out? And um, it, it is a sort of mutual respect of time to some extent. That why is this relevant? When I, I, I make, as you know, I make you know, dozens of introductions and connections a week. And I will, in some cases, I'll go to great lengths to talk to both sides, prep them as to why they should be meeting each other. In other cases, it's, it's written, but there is not a singular generic, you should meet, you know, you two should meet without any context. It just doesn't make sense. And I think that's the kind of thing that, that people need to spend a lot more time on. And then the other one that I find is a common one, when in a presentation, if it is a really complicated topic and you know maybe I'm not tracking or I'm not following that I find too many entrepreneurs get frustrated that it's the investor's fault, that they're not, you know, they're not smart enough to understand or they don't get it. And to Greg's point earlier, um, you're gonna hear a lot of no's um, many of them have, may have nothing to do with you, but when you make somebody else feel stupid, there's a very high likelihood they're going to say no because people just don't want to feel stupid. And frankly, it's not their fault. It's, it could be you did a very bad job of actually communicating the, the value proposition or the solution or the problem or whatever it may be. And so to me, those are probably two of the most common that I see. And back to what I said at the outset about you want to do business with other people. When you feel uh, insulted as a, as a person, you typically don't want to probably spend a lot of time with that other person. And so that's where, you know, having good coaches, good uh, communications help like you provide can be so valuable and some of those could be misinterpreted from a, a cultural mismatch as well. And I think those all can be overcome if you're aware and you, you, you do your homework. So hopefully that helps as a, as a couple key ones that I see. No, oh, that's great. Thanks, Gary. Greg, how about you? Yeah, I think the, um, the I guess this, the, the marketing, I think I would call it positioning of the entrepreneur is quite a, is the is the, is is kind of what if I can, can sum up what Carrie and Ariel both said is um I mean the likability factor is uh, is the elephant in the room it's the massive you know it's the massive factor that uh, it's very hard for us to invest in people that we don't um, like or want to work with that you're you're talking about a relationship that's going to be three to five years um, with, or with more the, with, or more yeah often. Unfortunately, much more than that very often. <laughs> but, um, but fortunately, sometimes that much longer. But it's a, it's a long relationship. So, you know, the ability to look introspectively into yourself and to find, um, you know, to, to craft both what the, what, you know, to use Ariel and her abilities to craft what people perceive of you, but also how you perceive of yourself so that when you meet with the investors, you know, I think a really good way to do it is to have really a lot of confidence and to look at this as that you are, you are matching with them. You're not going to get lucky and get them to say yes. And you're not going to, um, and you're not going to sell them either. You, it's, a, it's really like a chemistry test. You know, it's, um, you know, how is, how is my personality with this team's personality? How is my company with their capital? You know, there's kind of like four factors that have to all interact in the right way. And um, if you can find those, I mean, you know, there's a, I think there's a, a great saying that there's, a, there's, you know, there's, there's always money for great ideas and great entrepreneurs. Um, there's sometimes money for not so great ideas and not so great um, entrepreneurs. But um, so if you can keep crafting yourself and building yourself and your position and your perception of, of yourself as a strong, likable, trustworthy, hardworking, um, clever, um, and you can match that with um, the investors, you're going to have a lot more success, I think. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, we actually, sorry, I'm getting some more questions here. So I want to make sure that we get these in. Um, so this one, I think it, it's very dependent, I guess, for either of you. Uh, when pitching to you as investors in this new pandemic world we're all having to adjust to, is the best pitch to be done in person rather than Zoom, or does that not matter for either of you? 
Well, the best pitch is always ahead, person. Yeah, the best pitch. <laughs> I, mean, like, I mean, being in person, there's nothing that compares to being in person. Um, we have made one investment, I think that was pure Zoom, I think. Um, we are making a couple investments which are Zoom related. Uh, there's Zoom for the main entrepreneur, but we still had someone on the team or the board that we know in, in person and have a relationship with. Um, I mean, it's great that the world is getting closer to this. I think, I mean, of course, the more, you, the more in person and the more ability you have to break bread with your investor, the better. Because like we said, it's a long relationship. Carrie, you probably have some thoughts. I, on I agree. I mean, all things being equal, always would prefer to do that. Um, my advice in this world, if that's not possible right now, is to find the as many common sort of as you mentioned, Greg, those scenarios. We know this person because of this other person whom we have broken bread with. Or how mm -hmm. how do you build a proxy for that that is much deeper and stronger than you may have in the past? Where maybe in the past you had one reference and we've spent time together. Now you may need many, many more. And I would advise that you try to build many, many more people who could support and uh, sort of vouch for you in, in this digital world. So we, because we still are trying to figure out what the right level of, of sort of uh, virtual credibility needs to look <laughs> like. I think, I think it's still a very open discussion and it's going to differ person to person as to how open-minded uh, they may be about it, but but I think as an entrepreneur, the burden of proof is on you to really deliver more of that credibility. So what are the most common mistakes uh, that you guys have found when you've seen all these companies pitch to you? So Kara, you can start off if you'd like. So I, mean, I mentioned, from... a, I, yeah, I mentioned right. a couple of them. I think, you know, the, um, the one that, that I, I probably have the biggest challenge with is the, the pitch deck from my perspective is the perfect scenario. It's like, this is us with it all figured out exactly how it's going to go perfect. And, and you know, we, we get involved at the very early stages where I'm highly confident that that's not what's going to happen. That that's, that's the perfect scenario, that's the vision. <laughs> And so my, the conversation that I want to have with founders is, okay, I see what perfect looks like. I know it's not going to be perfect. I know you don't have it all figured out. You know, you don't have it all figured out. So I want to understand how are you going to develop a rigorous process for figuring it out and convince me that you, you have an open mind and a learning approach that's intellectually honest and rigorous to go do this because that that to me is is if they are this is what's going to happen and this is the only path by which uh any success can be possible But some of that's even a, a test of like how adaptable and, and resilient are they? And so I think those are, those to me are, are some of the, the common mistakes that, that leave a first impression that may or may not be the one that uh, you really want to leave. And so I think being cognizant of those kinds of things is so critical uh, and, and can impact likability like Greg, Greg talked about. Oh, absolutely. Greg, uh, if you have any more, I know we've, we've went through so many great examples, but if you have any more, and I'd also like to hear from both of you, what are some positive examples you'd like to share from some really great memorable pitches where you either did invest or maybe you didn't invest, but you would have liked to, but just the timing wasn't right for some reason, but you really, that stuck out, or especially with a startup or an entrepreneur. Well, I think, you know, I think the, uh, a good example uh, is, um, 
to add a, as a good example, um, I think one thing Carrie mentioned, which I think you can re revisit, is the concept of resilience. Um, it's very common for us, for me and my career and my life, to do deals with somebody um, not on the first meeting and the first pitch. You know, um, our best investment this year, I think um, X margin, um, so far X margin uh, back in Silicon Valley, you know, Darshan, um, great CEO, amazing energy. We've known him in a previous life. Um, and he pitched us a year ago. And, you know, it, the traction wasn't there. We weren't sure if he had this team, you know, this team ability. Came back six months later. He came back eight months later. He had the traction. Um, so we led, So we ended up leading the round. Um, there was no, you know, there's no harm, no foul in pitching. You know, you don't get harm or foul by getting a no and pitching and, and staying in, in relationship with a, with a firm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Ariel knows I, I, I do some, uh, I teach uh, negotiations sometimes at the university and some other places. And the one thing to always remember is that the deal is not, you know, the deal is not ever, um, you always have to be continuing the relationship after the deal is either yes or no. Mm -hmm. Because I'd say, I'd say at least half visits, second pitches, um, restructured pitches, um, no traction replaced with new traction, no traction on old concept now with a pivoted new model. You know, we have an open mind because we want to succeed. Um, and the other side of that is to really understand what the investor's business is. You know, our business is to, um, is to help companies succeed so that we can make money. You know, so if your deal structure um, is uh, not really conducive to, um, you know, us, you know, like um, maintaining some access to information, some control, um, some safety on the downside, um, some safety as the rounds increase, then you aren't understanding our side of, of the model. Um, and that really can hold entrepreneurs back. You know, they think of it as a, give me the money game where, and I've been there, I've been, you know, I've been entrepreneur several times uh, and, you know, you feel like I just need the money to get to this next level. Um, in this new Zoom era, I think that the entrepreneurs will have to be more comfortable with more controls um, from the investors because if I don't know you, for sure, I need to have uh, reserve matters or a board seat. Um, because, you know, I don't have any context other than the Zoom relationship. Um, so I need to know that when the decisions are making, you know, there's a per capsule document that we're signing that's, you know, okay, we're selling the company or we're taking another round or something like that. Um, if you don't have that relationship already. How, how many meetings yeah, somebody so has? How many points many... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kerry. Yeah, uh, I just, I just, yeah. Greg, that, yeah there, there's a lot of great, great stuff in there. So I just wanted to say. Thank you. I, I agree that. Yeah. Perfect. So, so uh, this goes along to actually what we're talking about here. Uh, somebody, Mark asked, how many meetings uh, would you expect to have with a founder before writing a check? So I know that this varies really, but uh, from both of your perspectives, what has been your experience? Yeah. I, I mean, I think in this Zoom era, especially, it's a lot more than uh, probably if, if they're traveling to, to meet, uh, historically face to face you may have the number of meetings may be fewer but they might be more deeper because you're you're traveling to get together in in this era you know, we have some companies that we we meet with every day for weeks and weeks to just keep progressing toward okay you know are, we we think we're on the right page let's let's talk about this topic and so i think it my sense has been we we have these things have used this uh, environment to just get more information to, to Greg's point, building that relationship is part of it. And uh, it, at times it, it, it may be no or not now, or I often will give entrepreneurs assignments to say, Hey, go, go figure this out or learn this and come back to me. And I'm amazed at how few of them actually ever do that. And, you know, the, you're, you're asking about best pitches. The ones that are the most memorable to me are when someone says, 
this is what I'm going to go do. And I say, that's, that sounds great. And then they come back and say, here's what I told you I was going to go do. And we did it. And here's what we're going to go do next. And they start to build this reliability where you go, wow, okay. Like this is a person that I want to potentially be in business with because they stand out because they're a good communicator. They're focused on what matters. They're delivering against that. And I tell a lot of founders, the best, the best thing you can probably do in the mind of an investor is get them to really start believing this person's going to succeed with or without me. I, I yeah. want to be involved because they're going to succeed with or without. They don't need me to be successful. That's actually almost a, a great position. So, I mean, one of the, the you know, just personal, and this was outside of my uh, sort of professional investing life. I made a personal investment into a friend of mine's company. Now it's been over 10 years and he started a, a now pretty successful restaurant chain and it took him six months to convince me to eat lunch with him there. And we had lunch there at the very first restaurant and we finished lunch and I said, I'm in like, this is, this is good. And this is going to work. And uh, that was, you know, he wasn't even pitching me. And it was one of those classic ones where he said, I don't, want nor need your money and I said I understand that that's why I want in right and so uh, I think you know creating that momentum um, is is key and so I think you know building those relationships far in advance of needing them is really the the probably the core advice I would give you're, you're in a tough spot if you if you're in this like we either have to have this money or we're going we're closing the doors or going off the cliff. You just don't ever really want to have to be in that position. And unfortunately it just happens. Yeah. Too often. yeah to add to that, you, you're rarely going to get the money if that's your pitch. That's right. Um, Cause uh, we don't want to have the, you know, the kind of like the, the death risk uh, mm-hmm. moment. I, to, I want to just add the, what Carrie said, cause it was so fantastic. His, his story. Um, I think uh, when I was uh, uh, when I was doing a lot of uh, deals at the UBS Investment Bank, uh, one of the things when I'm meeting with the even, you know, billion dollar CEOs down to you know first time deal CEOs, you know, there's three main value drivers, which is one is the intrinsic value of the company, traction, business model, that kind of stuff. Second is your strategic relationships or strategic like strategic money. We come in often as an investor, and we can actually add value because of our strategic fintech portfolio and our activities in the group because the group has activities from that in AI, in AI and in, in, in digital, in, in digital FinTech. Um, and the third is in competitive tension. People forget that value pricing, you know, the greatest pitches are the ones where they really proving that they don't need us. I hate to say it because we're humans, but the reality is uh, if he comes to me and he says, you know, Casey's going to, he wants to take the whole round. I don't know if there's going to be room for you. Um, immediately, I know that I have to get to investment committee and get my act together quickly. If he's saying, we're hoping that you might come in and then we're going to go find other people. Uh, generally, most VCs I know are, are going to wait and see how you do, you know, and see how you know, wait till you get to the next level. If there's no competitive tension, you're not driving your own, um, your own valuation and your own close capability. So we only have a couple minutes left. So I'm just going to get in a couple of the questions that I think uh, had a lot of interest. Um, Amazon, Mark says, Amazon famously didn't turn a profit for 14 years. How long are you comfortable to pump money into a company before you see an ROI? Yeah, I, I, I would look at it. Money makes it sound horrible already. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, my general attitude would be that is a great exception in the history of uh, the world of, of businesses and that those are, those are often bad models to, to point to because there just aren't many cases. Well, like that. I mean, look, I, you know, but, but, but I think it's a, it's really a function of, do you have a good understanding of um, how value is created in your business and what the uh, cash flow and, and margin dynamics are. And so usually when a business is quote unquote not profitable for an extended period, it's because there is extreme value being created through the way investment dollars are being put into that business from a 
uh, either it's you know getting market share growth uh, or building up long term asset value that that is going to create cash flow at some point. So um, you know the yeah. That's the way I think about it. And, and I think, you know, a good entrepreneur actually understands that. I, I think, or they have a good CFO partner or investor partner who can help them understand that. Um, but this, this perpetual money losing experiment is not, you know, I, I was an investor in a company that, that was more like that. And it got really frustrating uh, years and years along. Yeah. To, to add to that, I think at Amazon, uh, just to, uh, I'll try and disagree with Carrie just a little, so if you can have a, like, at least one time, we <laughs> do that. Um, which is that Amazon, I mean, it's it's an exception kind of, but Amazon was they had massive traction and business model proof yes. early on. You know, they were not turning a profit as a group for 14 years, but in each of his business areas, he was proving that he had traction, massive, massive growth. For, you know, massive growth on the sales side. And he had, um, I'm, and I don't have the internal things, and I'm sure we could talk to Madrona or, or you know, the, these early investors, but they were showing um, profit within the business. And because of their an online marketing business, you know, they have a model. You have cost per acquisition, you have average annual, you know, you have average monthly user, you know, like um, revenue, mo- revenues, ARPU, you have uh, churn, who's the stopping you know, their purchase profile. So they had a really detailed lifetime value and, and uh, ability in that company because it's purely digital. So, you know, if it's Amazon, we're going to be happy to keep investing and investing, investing, or let it ride. Um, if it's as Carrie said, it's, you know, losing money and the model's not being proven, then, you know, we're not comfortable, you know, you know right away. In our, in our firm too, we're very focused on, you know, revenue, you know, revenue active type businesses. Like um, uh, we invested in X margin, in Deribit, in Paradigm, um, in Luca, in Big.ai. Um, these companies all have, you know, customers and transaction based revenues early on. So we can see the scalability. If their fixed costs are growing, it's because we know it's happening. But on a marginal basis, we see that we, you know, we're not comfortable. Our type of firm is not comfortable investing um, very, you know, we're hoping to actually, you know, come in strong in the early stages and have companies that can prove that they um, earn great investors later on through, you know, great traction. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much, uh, Carrie and Greg. I know that we have our sponsor that wants to say a, a little bit before our time is up. So everybody, if you have any more questions, I know we didn't get to some, but please add us all on LinkedIn and we'll be happy to answer questions for you. So Francesco, I'll let it go back to you. Thank you very much, Ariel, and thanks to you, Carrie and Greg, for joining us today. Uh, just before we close off the, the event, I uh, wanted to remind you all that, like Ariel just said, uh, you can connect to, to us and to the speakers, uh, and if there is any burning questions that has not been answered, um, please, and you're confused about whom to reach out to, uh, do reach out to us at Silicon Roundabout. We'll try our best to connect you to the right person. And now, like I said before, closing off, I'd like to invite Liviu uh, from uh, Team Art, who has made this event possible, and really thank him and allow him just to share uh, his his thanks today uh, and uh, remind us all uh, and you potentially how we could connect to to the people. Let's let's remind us that Liviu helped us connect to these great speakers, help this event come together. So Liviu, do you want to just uh, tell everyone um, how they can connect to you and how you could potentially help founders with? All right. Uh, thank you very much, for, uh, everyone, for, for your support. Uh, I wish this kind of event I knew of uh, when I first started your company. So uh, uh, that's uh, that's awesome that uh, we are uh, happy we were able to to support the community through um, Silicon Roundabout. And I'm really grateful to Ariel, Carrie, and Greg for their time and wisdom here. Um, and uh, what I can say about us is that we provide software development services by assembling. Uh, teams for various uh, customers, both large, large and, and small. Uh, we can help startups accelerate and uh, grow by providing capacity around the globe in Eastern Europe, Vietnam, and Canada. And so that would be for I don't know, machine learning, uh, mobile, and various uh, types of scalable applications. 
Um, we believe that trust is important in this space, so that's why we started this series of webinars um, to help provide more perspectives and opportunities and be respectful, respectful about your time while hoping to, to get to know you better. Um, so feel free to, to reach out uh, to, via LinkedIn or uh, drop us an email at uh, office at uh, tmart.ro. I'm sure that will be circulated via, uh, via the email as well. So uh, again, thank you very much for, for your support and uh, looking forward to, um, to, to grow together. Thank you very much, Dave. You. So uh, we've come to, the, to 6 p.m. here at, uh, uh, at London. So once more, thank you all again. I've just linked uh, the next event of the series where we'll be again with Livio and uh, discover some more insights into how to scale up your startup business. And uh, we'll be focusing, focusing on strategy and development on that one. So make sure, sure you sign up. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us today. That's all for me, Francesco, and the Silicon Roundabout team. See you next time. Thank you so much, everyone.